Hello everybody. For the next uh, half an hour, we're going to be discussing the new Met RADS system for standardized reporting of whole body MRI. These are my uh, disclosures. So what is Met RADS and why do we need it? Met RADS translates into metastasis reporting and data system if you look at the official publication. But I sometimes say Met RADS stands for metastasis response and a diagnosis system. Why do we need it? We need it because current imaging tools leads uh, to poor confidence for assigning the malignant cancer state and for assessing response. So limitations with current imaging tools mean that we are unable to accurately predict the presence and the extent of metastatic disease. So oftentimes when we think patients have no metastatic disease, they in fact do have metastatic disease. When we think patients have low volume metastatic disease, they have high met high, higher volumes. Similarly, we have a limited ability to depict the heterogeneity of the expressed biological phenotype. In other words, just by looking at the tumor, you can't tell how heterogeneous the tumor is. But we also know that the heterogeneity in the setting of therapy response predicts for poor patient outcomes. Finally, we are unable to identify who is not benefiting early after starting therapy using currently available techniques, which means that we fail to detect primary and in fact secondary resistance, which often impedes patients' progress to alternative therapies. I thought I'd show you this example of somebody with castrate-resistant prostate cancer being treated with a targeted therapy called enzalutamide. We can see that at baseline we have a whole body MRI scan and we have a bone scan. The whole body MRI scan demonstrates the presence of retroperitoneal lymph nodes. There are no bony lesions. At week 13, the PSA is now well suppressed below 1. The retroperitoneal lymph nodes have improved on the whole body MRI scans. At week 25, this is when oligoprogression occurs. And we can see a small dot here uh, confined to a particular vertebral body, which we fail to detect on the bone scan. How do we know that this is metastatic disease? Well, the whole body MRI technique enables us to zoom in on this area. And remember that we've got two prior scans with which to make a comparison. So we can say for sure that this is oligoprogression at the 25th week. Now, of course, the standard of care is the bone scan, so the patient continues on therapy. And 12 weeks later, you can see the PSA is still suppressed, this time at 0 0.04. Now we see that there are five lesions on the bone scan, sorry, on the whole body MRI scan, but only two lesions on the bone scan. Now, remember, this does not constitute progression because progression needs to be confirmed before therapy is changed. So then the patient receives another 12 weeks of treatment, at which point we confirm progression both on bone scans and on the whole body MRI scans. So the actual date of oligoprogression was tw tw week 25. The date when we confirmed polymetastatic disease was week 50, so 25 weeks later. But look how much the volume of disease has increased before we were definitely able to uh, change this patient's therapy. And this need to wait to confirm polymetastatic bone scan progression within the prostate cancer working group 3 criteria means that there is a delay in starting the next treatment, which many of us would find unacceptable. So it's on this background that the MedTRIAD system was introduced for whole body MRI scanning. Now, the MedTRIAD system defines a number of goals. The first of these goals is to establish minimal technical parameters for data acquisition that is suitable for quantitative analysis. So here you can see the METRADS paper that was published in European Urology in 2017. And recently, the Quantitative Whole Body MRI Technical Workgroup has uh, 
produce recommendations on optimization and quality control for whole body MRI scanning, which you should be able to get shortly. Um, now, the METRADS standard groups sequences by indications. So the core protocol in the middle column here is used for detection and characterization and simply consists of a sagittal T1 sequence, a STIR sequence, and then a Dixon technique either performed in the axial or coronal plane and then some diffusion weighted images. Of course you are free to add additional sequences such as T2 and regional assessments if you want to, but then you're really moving into the comprehensive protocol. The comprehensive protocol recommends again a sagittal T1 and stir sequence through the spine, but this time recommends axial and coronal uh, Dixon techniques with mandatory reconstructions of the fat fraction. The number of B values on the diffusion sequence also increases from 2 to 3, but you'll see that we now have included the axial T2s through the whole body, which serves to as an anatomical reference. And of course, you can do regional assessments, for example, looking at the brain, or you may need to give contrast enhancement. So the comprehensive protocol is going to take longer than the core protocol. So the core protocol should take about 30 minutes, and here is a typical uh, series of images from the core protocol applied to multiple myeloma. You can see the STIR, the T1 sequence of the spine, and then a MIPT projection of the high B value image. And if we just look where the red line is and take an axial image through that area, you'll notice that there are two quantitative sequences. So here you have the in phase, opposed phase, the water and the fat image, and these fat fraction reconstructions are considered mandatory. Similarly, in the core protocol, you'll see that there are two B values, B50, B900, from which there is a mandatory reconstruction of an ADC map. So two quantitative sequences and morphological imaging. Now the comprehensive protocol takes a little bit longer, as I was saying, and it includes axial T2s through the whole body and a fat fraction in two planes, coronal and axial. And the high B value B800 image is then used to reconstruct the coronal reconstructions, as you can see in the movie, and of course the MIP projection, which is displayed at as an inverted gray scale. So just to summarize that, you can see that this is the core versus the comprehensive protocol, including the reconstructions that need to be made. Again, just to recap, axials or coronals, uh, different slice thicknesses um, for the core protocol, axial and coronals for the comprehensive assessment, 2B values for the core protocol, 3B values for the comprehensive protocol, and these are the reconstructions that you need to do. For example, the high B value images are reconstructed as 3D MIPS displayed as rotating images. We tend to use 3 degree angles and 120 images using an inverted grayscale. And the B, high B value image is also reconstructed in the coronal plane as 5 millimeter thick slices. The second aim of the METRAD system is to enable standardized collection of the disease phenotype based on the common anatomical spread of the of the disease. So for example, in breast cancer, the local regional disease is the primary disease, axillary and SCF lymph nodes, whereas for the prostate cancer, clearly it's the prostate gland and pelvic lymph nodes, but you'll notice that we are up to the aortic bifurcation. The skeletal sites are the same for both the breast as well as the prostate protocol, but the region, but the soft tissue spread of disease is different. So for the prostate, you have retroperitoneal lymph nodes, other nodes, then liver, lungs, and other sites. Whereas for breast cancer, we have liver, lungs, brain, and other sites. So you can see that we varied the regions depending on the type of cancer. So for each region, 
you have to decide whether there is anatomical involvement or not, yes or no. And then if it is involvement, if there is involvement, then in the response assessment um, setting, a primary and a secondary response assessment category is allocated. So the primary response assessment category is based on the dominant response of more than half the lesions within a region. The primary RSC is based on the dominant response of more than half the disease within a region. The secondary RAC response assessment category is for the second most frequent pattern. However, if you have a minor component of progression, then it automatically becomes part of the secondary RAC. So you can see the RAC categories are shown here. Category 1 is response highly likely. Category 3 is stable disease. Category 5 is progression highly likely. And some of the rules that we apply for each region are given here in this box beneath the diagram. And the whole of this is summarized within a Metrides template report, um, which you can see here on the left. And then we have a uh, diagram on the right hand side, which summarizes what is observed. Now for this, we've had to develop new criteria to assess the response of metastatic bone disease. Whereas, and these are called the Metrides criteria. Whereas for the soft tissues, what we've done is use Resist V1.1 and the Prostate Cancer Working Group 2 criteria uh, for the soft tissues. So, for example, you'll see that for each response assessment category, we've got soft tissue disease, and then we have bones. You can see the soft tissues are assessed using RESIST or Prostate Cancer Working Group 2 criteria for the uh, prostate gland, for example. And so if you have a Category 5 uh, progression highly likely, so in a, a bone that would be new critical fractures requiring radiotherapy or surgical intervention, unequivocal focal or diffuse areas of increasing metastatic infiltration, Inc unequivocal increase in the number of size and focal lesions, the emergence of new lesions, provided their ADC values are between 600 and 1,000. So essentially, we've converted these images showing progression into um, criteria, which then inform on the response assessment category. Now let me just show you an example of a 67-year-old patient with metastatic prostate cancer who is progressing on maximum androgen blockade or sometimes called a combined androgen blockade. And we can see that on the STIR sequence and on the T1 that the patient has developed new metastases throughout the spine. And that is also, of course, observable on the diffusion uh, sequences in the right two columns. Now, if we just look at the ADCs, you can see the ADC pre-treatment was 837, uh, post-treatment's 931, so no change in the ADC. And you can see here are the corresponding histograms. And here is the distribution of the disease that you have just observed. Now, how do we summarize this? We summarize it by providing uh, clinical colleagues with images, a written report and a diagram. And I just want to highlight the diagram and see how we've filled it. So you can see the status of the soft tissue disease is on the left. The status of the bone disease is on the right. Here's the overall assessment. Here is any notes that you may want to write to your clinician. So for every box is a region. And for each region, we decide what is is there involvement or not? So, so primary region involvement, yes or no. So here is the primary region before. Here's the primary region afterwards. So response assessment category, definitely progressing. Five, five. 
and there is rectal involvement so you have a chance to write a note in there and similarly you can go down the rest of the body so in this particular instance there was no liver disease there was no lung disease there were no retroperitoneal lymph nodes but if you look at other nodal sites yes there was other nodal sites and you can see new axillary nodal disease emerging so we can write axilla uh, progressing but other nodal sites were stable similarly the bones are on this side yes means it is involved five means more than half the lesions are involved or not that's the primary response assessment category this is the second response assessment category and you can see they more than 50% of the lesions are progressing and the other lesions are also progressing which is why it becomes a 5-5 five five. The overall response categories are shown here, and this is what the clinician will mostly look at. So you can see for nodes, viscera, bones, and the primary tumor, we either say no disease, complete response, partial response, stable disease, and progression, and you just have to tick uh, which category the patient is in. And here you can see that you can write down a note saying there is actually bladder and rectal involvement. So this is a typical met rads report for prostate cancer progressing now for somebody who is responding we have used again morphological criteria as well as adc criteria uh, in this particular instance we've used the delta adc the change in the adc and the response categories are of course one and two where one is response highly likely again we have adapted the for soft tissues the rhesus criteria and the prostate cancer working group 2 criteria for partial uh, response but you can see for bone disease there are new categories so for example the return of normal bone marrow bone marrow in previously infiltrated disease the decrease in the number and size of lesions the evolution of a diffuse neoplastic involvement to a focal pattern but you'll see at the bottom here what we've now got is previous evidence of previously evident lesions showing an increase in ADC from less than 1400 to more than 1400 for example or more than a 40 percent increase in ADC from the baseline with corresponding decreases in signal intensity and morphological findings consistent with responding disease so I just wanted to show you an example of this. So here is a patient responding to docetaxel, uh, again, in the setting of prostate cancer. If you looked at the T1 sequences alone, you would say this was stable. You can see some increase in the signal intensity of the bone marrow, and the soft tissue within the central spinal canal here and here has a decrease. So clearly this patient is responding, except the T1 appears to suggest that the patient is progressing. If you look at the diffusion sequence, you can see that there's a reduction in the overall volume of the diffusion rate of signal intensity abnormality, but is this associated with an increase in ADC? And here is the ADC histogram before treatment, here is the ADC histogram after treatment, so you can see the ADC increases from about 700 to about 1500, and this increase in ADC is diagnostic of responding metastatic disease. Now you've seen a couple of these images where there, you can see there's a color coding of the um, ADC maps that are projected onto the high B value images. So the color coded images are derived from the ADCs. We take the ADC pre-treatment, find the 95% threshold of that, and we can read that off here. You can see it's 1070, and we apply all voxels that are less than 1070 are color red so you can see here they are there 95 percent of the voxels are red and you can see that anything above 1500 is considered cell kill or highly likely to be responding and we color yellow for those voxels that are between red and yellow so this becomes no treatment effect likely response and highly likely response and if we now look at the post-treatment 
ADC projection, you can see that there are still areas of red projected on the spine, and these represent areas where there is still uh, treatment resistance, so the patient really does need to carry on and have more treatment. So again, how would you communicate this? We would provide an, a set of images, such as these ones on the left. You can see that I have provided the Metrides diagram on the right, and you can see, is there skull involvement? No. Is there cervical spinal involvement? Yes, but you can see the primary response assessment category is 1, secondary response assessment category is 1. Similarly, retroperitoneal lymph nodes, you can see these lymph nodes here. Are they involved? Yes, I could still see them on this, on the axial images. The primary response assessment category is 1. The second response assessment category was 1. So this is just extreme examples of patients responding and non-responding. One of the advantages of the METRAD system is that it enables recording of the presence, location, and the extent of mixed or discordant responses. And I just wanted to show you an example of that. So here's a patient. 55 year old being uh, treated with radium 223. Symptomatically, the patient is worse. He's become transfusion dependent. His albumin is dropping, but you'll notice that his PSA has gone down and his alkaline phosphatase has gone down. So here we have a mixed clinical picture where morphologically there could be progression on the T1 sequence. But the T2 sequence suggests that he might be responding. The clinical picture suggests that he's getting worse. The PSA suggests that he's getting better. So you can appreciate the confusion amongst the clinician. If you now look at the high B value sequence uh, as a MIP, you can see that initially there was bone disease and there was this lymph node here in the right common iliac region. On the follow-up, there are new retroperitoneal lymph nodes, but there seems to be increasing bone disease. And you can see there's another area up here which represents nodal disease. So it looks as though the nodes are getting worse, but the bones are probably getting worse, particularly here in, in the pelvis. Now, we do need to look at the ADCs, particularly in the spine. Now, when we look at the ADCs, you see something quite dramatic. So here in the dorsal spine, pre-treatment, it was high signal on the high B value and a low ADC, i.e. active tumor. Look what happens with treatment. You get a reduction in the overall signal intensity, although you do see some areas here of high signal intensity. But look what happens to the ADC. You see the ADC, in fact, increases in a number of these vertebral bodies. Quite the opposite is happening here in the lumbar spine. So here's the lumbar spine before. Here's the lumbar spine after. You can see there are still areas of dark. But whereas here you had low signal on the high B value image, you can see that, in fact, this suggests that the patient may be progressing in the lower lumbar spine. And you can confirm that on the other projections. So here is the lower lumbar spine. Here's the upper lumbar spine. You can see an increase in signal intensity associated with areas of lower ADC, i.e. disease progression. In the dorsal spine, the signal intensity reduces, but the ADC goes up, suggesting response. And you can see there's also response in the proximal uh, ephemera also. So this is a classical example of a, a mixed response. So if we summarize that, what we can say is that this change in T1 in fact represents pseudo progression because we've already documented on ADC that this high signal intensity here in the dorsal spine in fact is a response, whereas we now know that in the lumbar spine that this is in fact true progression because the ADC stayed low in the lumbar spine. So this is an example of a mixed response. And here are the, here is the example of those color maps that I showed you previously. Now, interestingly, what you'll notice is that this lymph node here in the right common iliac region, in fact, has responded. Become, it's gone from being red to 
green, in other words, it's gone from no treatment effect to highly likely to be responding. Whereas in the lumbar spine here, you can see the color is red, indicating that these voxels here are in the active range. But you can see that there are areas, patchy areas of response, for example, here in the humeri and here in the femoris. So a classical um, discordant response. So how do you record that with the Metroid system? Well, you simply follow the rules that I have already outlined. So the primary tumor, most of it was stable, but there was some progression. Pelvic lymph nodes were progressing. So five, but there were some lymph nodes that were stable. We saw the emergence of new retroperitoneal lymph nodes, so that becomes a 5-5. Five, five. And we had new axillary lymph nodes indicating, uh, sorry, a new axillary lymph node, a single node, so you get a single score uh, for the left axilla. Similarly, for the dorsal spine, we can say that the more than half the lesions were responding in the cervical and dorsal spine, although some lesions were stable, whereas in the lumbar spine there was new disease, so more than half the lesions were progressing, and the other half of the lesions were also progressing. And you can write yourself a note. Progression in the nodes, i.e. pseudoprogression in the dorsal spine, but true progression in the lumbar spine. And you can record that here. So the primary tumor is progressing, the nodes are progressing, no disease in the viscera. And you can see for the bones, we write that overall we felt that there was a response, but there was a major discordance occurring. And this word major enables the clinician to look at the bones here and see where the, uh, where the uh, major discordant response was. And you can see that it was here in the lumbosacral spine. So what is the benefit of recording the spatial responses? It enables us to document the depth and the heterogeneity of response within the clinical routine. And you can derive objective metrics that reflects the response behaviors. So you can get a mean RAC, response assessment category, which is the overall depth of response. But you can also get an idea of the heterogeneity of response behaviors in something called the response heterogeneity index. We don't have time to discuss today the how the response heterogeneity index is in fact derived, but you should know that we can ca we can calculate a disparity and a complexity index, and it's the product of the disparity and the complexity that enables the, the response heterogeneity index to be derived. But the important thing to remember is that the response heterogeneity index enables us to predict progression-free survival. So in this particular experiment, we looked at 33 patients who did not experience primary uh, progression on the first response assessment scan. And what you notice is that if your response heterogeneity index was greater than four, in other words, more discordance during the first response assessment category, that you were less likely to stay on treatment and median was about one year or so. Whereas if you had a lower response heterogeneity index, in other words, everything was behaving more or less the same, you were much more likely to stay on the same treatment for a longer period of time. And you can see that the progression-free survival was 12 versus 24 months in uh, this particular cohort of patients with ER-positive breast cancer that were being treated with hormonal therapy. And I just show, thought I'd show you an example of a woman who has a primary in uh, situ. You can see here it is on the left. We have uh, numerous bone lesions, but between the two examinations, July and September 2015, we see that there is not much change. So here is the primary tumor. Here are some deposits in the pelvis. They don't change much. This had a response heterogeneity score of one. In other words, there was nothing seemed to change. And this patient is still on first line systemic um, hormonal therapy after 24 months of treatment. 
but compare that to this patient who has a much wider range of responses. So you'll see that this is the primary breast tumor. Here you have axillary lymph nodes. And you can see that the primary tumor and axillary lymph nodes seems to respond between February and June 2014. There are some lesions, these yellow ones, that seem to stay stable. But here you'll notice a lesion that seems to be getting larger. Here it is, and you can see that this lesion is getting larger. So this particular patient's response heterogeneity score was 13.8, and this patient progressed after nine months of therapy. So if you observe a variety of behaviors on diffusion imaging on the first scan, the greater the variety that you observe, the less likely is that the patient will stay on treatment for a longer period of time. Met the METRAD system also enables us to collect data in a systematic way for outcomes monitoring in clinical trials. And of course, it allows education of radiologists. So finally, this is a uh, communication tool. If you want to see these cases in a great uh, detail, take a look at this article on the METRAD system, which you can find at this website. If you're interested in downloading the reporting template, again, if you go to this website, the same website, you can download this freely. The main article is available from European Urology. It is freely downloadable. So what are our next steps for METRADS? Clearly, we need to adapt METRADS to different cancers, and we've done that already for breast uh, cancer, and we're now in the process of adapting it for multiple myeloma. We need to assess the precision of the METRADS measurements by, uh, by documenting inter and intra-observer variability as well as its reproducibility. We need more studies comparing the response heterogeneity index as well as the depth of response with the progression-free survival uh, to a variety of treatments. And finally, we will need to design clinical trials uh, which are powered for biomarker validation. Thank you for listening to this lecture. I hope you found it useful. Uh, leave me some comments. Bye-bye.